Hey guys, this is Hunter Levine from the Captain's Collective, and in today's episode, we sit down with Eugene Shoulder of Fly Fish the Smokies. Eugene is our first freshwater captain and has been guiding for over 20 years. He was recently inducted into the Southern Trout Hall of Fame and is a third generation guide in the Smokies. Eugene owns his own fly shop and leads a large guide staff of over 20 guides. And in this episode, we talk about how to scale up a guiding business, hire the right staff, invest in the next generation, and how knowing the history of your area can help you out on the water. There's also a really great segment in here that you need to hear about how Eugene is working to build an internship program with the local area and high school. He's a really fun guy to be around, constantly spitting out great information, and knows his fishery really, really well. I think you guys are going to enjoy this one. Thank you for listening. This is the Captain's Collective. Success is a gift. Excellence is the only thing to strive for. Uh, he, 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 right. tried he tried to eat it. He tried to eat it. Hit him, hit him, hit him, hit him. He got him. He's on. Got uh, two butt caps off the rods, filled them with tequila. We took a shot and out we went. There, there ain't no getting into it after that. It's you're, you're hooked. It's a bad habit. And all the time, flips the, he's standing there ready to go for a tarpon. Anytime I said, you talk so much, you're like a senator. Hey, Eugene, thanks for hanging out with us tonight and coming on. We really appreciate you just giving us some time. Thank you. Appreciate you guys having me on here. Do you mind just giving us a little bit of a rundown about how you got into fishing, your family's history, and then also what led you to want to be a guide? Sure, Absolutely. Uh, my family was the uh, the fourth family to settle here in the uh, Great Smoky Mountains region, and uh, so we settled most of uh, Bryson City here and the uh, back up inside the National Park, where what's the National Park now. Um, my grandpa started guiding in uh, 1946. I'm a third generation guide, and uh, my grandpa came out of World War II and started guiding in 1946. Guided here till '79. My dad guided part time, and then uh, I knew from a very young age, I'm talking like nine, eight, nine years old, that I wanted to be a guide when I grew up. Uh, my family's like, you're going to college, get get some degrees, get some education, but you're, you know, this is what I wanted to do. So um, I'd tag along with my grandpa. I didn't tag along with dad so much when uh, when he was guiding or anything like that, but just fishing with him in general. As far back as I can remember, um, seriously, everything that we've ever done, we were just kind of a poor family that grew up here in the mountains. You don't have a lot of stuff. You're kind of isolated from the outside world in some, you know, some retrospects, which is great in, in ways, uh, maybe not so much in others, but the uh, – it worked out well because we, we spend a lot of time in the outdoors out here in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park enjoying the fisheries that we have. It's incredible what we have here. And uh, so every uh, pretty much everything we did involved with that. I didn't play sports growing up. I, I didn't have any desire to. All I wanted to do was fish, be on a trout stream. For years, I grew up on a, a little farm back up that bordered the National Park, which was as far back up against the park as you could be. Stream flowed out of it, crossed Folks Farm, and I, I got to fish for Southern Appalachian brook trout any day I wanted to go. So from... Um, Young age, my dad, my grandpa instilled in me catch and release. They would always say, turn him back, catch him another day. And so that's what I always done. So, I mean, it just it kills me for to keep anything. It kills me if I see anybody keep anything. Mm-hmm. I'm just like, just turn it back. Um, but, you know, I just uh, kept on. And, you know, it was a dream that I had that I wanted to do, and I just kept on at it. And then uh, when I got out of college, it was kind of the thing about getting confidence in yourself to know that you, you were – knowledgeable enough to take someone out and have a great time on the water and give them a quality experience that you want them to feel you want to share your passion with them of, of the the fishery and the things that that's around you and the, the surroundings that you have in the mountains here they're pretty unique and you you want to instill with them the passion that you have and so it took a bit to uh as i got out of college i started guiding a little bit for a local shop and then uh, next thing you know my parents call me up and they're like hey won't you kind of do your own thing here those guys don't keep you really busy at all and it'd be great if you, you could do your own thing and do it your way. And, uh, the fellow I'd helped out, he wasn't, he wasn't from here. It was from someone else. And so he did, wasn't really familiar with all the things that we actually had here. And whereas I was, so, um, with a gentle nud from my parents, I started my own thing. And then, uh, next thing you know, here we are today, uh, 23 years later, I have 16 guides in a fly shop and another outpost and, uh, looking to expand to another shop this year. And it's, it's been, it's been a fun ride. I mean, it's a really, I don't know. It's kind of incredible. Some days I look back at it, I'm like, this, this is really happening. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, it's a you know, childhood dream come true. And as small as that dream might be in the grand scheme of things for others, my, that was a, you know, I, it was great. I, I got to do what I wanted to do. And uh, fortunate enough to be able to feed my family doing that. And that's an awesome image, too, thinking about a kid wading around a creek dreaming about man maybe one day i could get paid to do this and then now you got a shop you got 16 guides under you what about it do you love the most meeting people um i'm very talkative by nature very inquisitive about others i mean i want to learn everything about you know you guys what you do and what you like to do and where you're from and so uh you know it's uh i think a whole lot's got to do with uh, just wanting to be around folks and being out there having a good time and showing them you sh- you know, sharing with them what what we have here and uh i think that's where a lot of that comes from was there ever a time for you that you thought about maybe not being a guide there you, i've questioned it uh, once i had a, a professional poker player that i was guiding and uh that was a that was a rough day with a fellow i mean it the fishing was good he you know, you get clients like that that's not going to listen to anything you say. They're older than you, and they're like, hey, I've been fishing longer, and you've been alive, and this is how I've done it on XYZ River or XYZ Water, and this is what this guy somewhere else told me to do, and it's what I'm going to do. And mm-hmm. it's like, hey, buddy, I, you know, what do I know? I just spent every day of my life here on this creek, but it's okay. But the uh, just getting just verbally beat up by this guy, and I mean, he's losing, mm-hmm. you know, 20-plus-inch fish that's right and left, and the uh, – it catches a few and you know it catches something that's 24 and, and just was like man we fish with bait bigger than this where i come from and i was mm-hmm. like man you just caught a trout in the smoky mountains it's 24 inch that's ridiculous people don't do that very often mm-hmm. and uh just coming home and i was like my gosh this is crazy do, do i really want to do this and i mean i'd been into it for six or seven years and i was like you know i'm not letting one person dictate that or change that the heck yeah this is what i want to do this is what i want to do my whole life and i'll be dang if i'm gonna let one jackass mm-hmm. stop that so i've kind of went about that with every obstacle that i've met along the way in business be you know regard you know with any of it it's like hey that's it's not gonna stop me mm-hmm. i'm just i'm willing to dig in and work harder than the next guy that's uh it's always been kind of my thing. I, I might not be the smartest guy in the room, but by God, I'll bet you I'll outwork any man in that room. It's just kind of the way I was brought up. Just growing up a poor country kid here in the mountains, you kind of scratch out a living and beat out a living out here, and we're, we're taught to work from a young age and work hard. And, uh, you know, you don't work, you don't eat. You just you got to make it happen. So just push forward and keep going with it. In 23 years guiding, you're going to have a couple of bad days like that. Oh, sure, sure. I mean, that's uh, – that's kind of the thing. You every once in a while you get it, and you look back at the grand scheme of things. It's like, okay, I got it three hundred and forty some plus days this year, and one guy. It's like, well, that's that's not bad odds. It's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, and it's easy to let that one that one guy kind of get stuck in your head, even though you maybe had twelve awesome days before that. Oh, sure. Just get stuck in your head thinking about what could have you done differently, or that's is it. he right, or is there a guide that he went with before that was better, but. You know, speaking of that, though, Austin, when we walked in here, we were doing sound check, talked about a little a little plaque you got over here for being guide of the year. Could you just tell us a little yeah, bit about that? Yeah, I'd like that? to ask you about that trophy. Yeah, okay, that's cool. Um, that was a really awesome surprise this year. That's the uh, – I got inducted into the Southern Trout um, Fly Fishing Hall of Fame this year back in January or February. And uh, for my little world here and what I do, that's the Super Bowl ring for this. It was, uh, it was actually incredible. I mean, the – I'd saw back in the fall that um, somebody had not, you know, somehow or another I ended up not being nominated for that. And I mean, you look at the names on the list of the 40 or so nominees in that, and these guys are, you know, greats in the sport and folks that I would looked up to and kind of admired along the way. And I thought, man, here's, yeah, whatever. And I just going on, think anything of it. I was like, this is never going to happen. That's cool. It's that there. I'm not even saying anything to anybody about this. Cause that's just, it's not going to happen. I don't want to be embarrassed because it's not going to happen. And uh, I'm checking my email one day in January there after the first of the year, and uh, I see an email pop up, and it says, uh, want to congratulate me um, as being going to be inducted in the, you know, the Southern Trout Fly Fishing Hall of Fame. And I looked at it, and I was like, yeah, that's not real. And mm-hmm. my fingers are tingling. My hands are tingling. I was like, God, this is this is happening? Holy cow. And uh, so I didn't – I just uh, – I marked it, the email as unread. My wife helps me check some of the emails that came in. We get such a high volume. She kind of helps me once in a while. And, a couple hours later, she must have saw it. She calls and she says, uh, have you seen this email? And I was like, oh, well, which email are you talking about? She said, Southern Trout. I said, you're uh, going to be inducted in the Fly Fishing Hall of Fame. What is that? 
so I, I told her, I was like, I was kind of thinking maybe I was seeing things there. So pretty excited about it. Um, it was a, a really neat experience. Um, it turned out I was the youngest person to ever be inducted into that Fly Fishing Hall of Fame there. Um, really cool. A lot of the fellows that were there picking up awards were picking up awards for their dads, and some of those gentlemen were in their 80s. And it mm-hmm. was really cool to, to be somewhere like that with – you know, folks you've admired and looked up to, and then here you are, you know, looked upon as their as a peer to them guys. I mean, that's kind of stuff like that don't happen every day. Come a long way from the country boy in the Smoky Mountains right there by the park. That's kind of it. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Josh had a similar email to that, but it was about an Arabian prince who needed him to wire some money. <laughs> <laughs> you can you can uh, read that email and check your trophy out next time you have a bad client. Yeah, yeah now the, you can <laughs> take, a, poker player. take a picture of that thing and send it on over to him. <laughs> that's you know, it. You know, you talked about when you were a kid, you would always release the fish because you wanted to see those fish caught again, and you were taught that. And something I think is really neat, you're not the first generational guide that we've sat down with, right. but there is this sense that uh, it's really neat to sit down with somebody and talk about what did their granddaddy teach their daddy that taught them. Mm-hmm. And I'd love for you just to talk about what are some of the different things and ways in which that was passed along in your family? Because you said your grandpa started guiding in 1946. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He did. And so that's a lot of collective knowledge in, in your bloodline. What did that look like for you guys to teach each other and kind of pass it down? It was kind of neat. Um, I'd get on the stream with dad and grandpa, and I mean, I'm doing this as a, at three, um, going out and fod tag along with grandpa. And some little, you know, the short trips are closer around to the house that weren't so much way out in the national park. Um, some stuff like in the Nana Hale River, which one of Trout Unlimited's top 100, that's right here, in, right here in our town. And it was literally where Grandpa's, where our whole home place is at out there. It's just really close. Um, get to tag along, and uh, they would teach you how to read streams and water and things. Um, you know, just fishing along by them, you know, with them and things would go out. They started out teaching me how to read water. I didn't start out t- with a cast in and start out with a fly rod in my hand. We, it's what we always fished with. But they would go along and show me how to read water like where's the trout at what's he hiding under where's he at or what's he eating and uh one of the biggest things this is funny the uh thing that sticks out the most is you know with with trout you're looking for oxygenation and that kind of thing so you're looking for foam on the water bubbles and oxygen lines and current seams and things like that so it's usually oxygen and foam typically associated with that so what grandpa and dad would tell me is like all right where's an old big trout laying out there where's his shaving cream on the water where's he been shaving this morning at so look for his shaving cream on the water and that's where he's gonna be Mm -hmm. So, you know, I see them shaving, and, you know, you got the sink there filled up with the suds and whatever. And so you associate that with the trout stream, and there's oxygenation. So to explain that to a child, hey, we're looking for oxygenation, they're going to hey, what's that big word? I don't even know what that means. But if it's looking for big old, old big trout shaving cream, you remember things like that. It mm-hmm. sticks with you. So it would start me with that, like little things they'd explain it, really break it down to where I could really understand, which was really was kind of neat. And I use a lot of that today with clients. So. You know, I tell little kids that sometimes when I'm out with them. We guide kids, and uh, they remember things like that. They look for it, and they're like, there's a shaving cream. I was like, that's right, buddy. You throw it right there. And sure enough, somebody's going to come up and grab that fly. Um, but I would do that with them. Grandpa especially would take me out, and uh, you know, he was like, all right, where do I cast? What should I tie on? Where should I cast? And he'd have me walk him through it. And, I mean, I'm, you know, three, four, five, probably not three. But, I mean, I was, mm-hmm. you know, out there with him to show me that stuff. But around five, I know that he was talking about that stuff and having me show him. Mm-hmm. I, was, I remember doing that a lot with him. And, uh, you know, a couple of times I'd say, okay, I, want, I think he needs to go there. And he's like, no, what's it missing? What's he need? And so, you know, it'd be missing depth or some kind of cover or something, you know, what have you. So it started out with that. And then um, at five years old, uh, got my first fly rod. And, uh, my goodness, that was the greatest day ever. I still have it. I still – my son oh, wow. drug it out of the closet the other day, and he come in there and – in the living room, he's like, hey, what's this old rod tube right here, Dad? And I was like, man, and he had it, just fixing to drag it out of there. He's 14. He's about as careless as uh, he yeah. can be. And I was like, dude, please, seriously, just let me take that out, and I'll show you that thing. I was like, but I'd I'd really be up, you know, pretty you still sad. still use it some? You know, once in a while, um, Dad's gone. Um, lost him years ago with a heart attack. He was 51 years old. Mm. And, uh, of course, Grandpa's gone. And uh, sometimes I get to missing them, and uh, you just get that old hurt and hole in your heart and that kind of thing. Get out there and go to your, you know, your stream that you fished with them on. You mm-hmm. take that old rod and you go out there and fish with old ghosts. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's some, it's pretty therapeutic to do that. I do that about once or twice a year. I've got a few different rods like that. I have one of my grandpa's old ones and one of my, two of my dad's old ones. And then uh, R.L. Winston Rod Company, which is, I absolutely love them. I'm not trying to plug somebody's rod company here, but it's just, I love Winston, love those guys out there. 
they custom did a, a, a rod in memory of my dad. And uh, the night he died, we was looking at a, a Winston catalog, and he was looking at a specific rod that they had that he wanted. Mm-hmm. And I thought, man, I'm going to buy dad that rod. And he was just thinking about, yeah, I'm, how do you think that'd be? I was like, it'd be cast pretty good. I think it'd be a good rod. So uh, I thought, man, I'm going to have him build this rod up and do it as their elite series and just deck this thing out. And uh, so once in a while, I'll take that thing out too. But, uh, you know, I'll take dad's old rod once in a while. And that's just a, it's a cool thing um, to get out there and, you know, get to fish where you fished with them. There's actually a hole in the smoking, but it's a run with a hole at the top of it that's named after my dad. It's called the Talman Shuler Hole. It's on Deep Creek. It's a place that my dad always liked to fish, this little section up through there, and he fished that often. And uh, a lot of the gentlemen around here, it's actually going in some stuff that's being worked on now with the park, for the park service. So it's kind of kind of cool to see something like that happen there. I was like, man, that's pretty neat to, to see. Um, but it's just kind of cool. It's that whole thing with your, you know, your family being here, your whole roots are here. I mean, they're as deep as anybody's get here. And uh, it's kind of kind of neat to see all that stuff out in front of you like that. And that's helpful too, just the idea of finding ways to kind of communicate to kids at age appropriate levels rather than saying oxen adjacent or whatever. Big you word. Can't, you can't I can't even say, say it. <laughs> I can't even say it. Uh, you know, that's why I'm I'm more of the shaving cream level guy with my vocabulary. But you know, that's a that's a great little tidbit. What did it look like as you got older and they began to bring you more information? you know, from, okay, at five, we're just trying sure. to help him think through these things. But obviously at some point you're 18. Oh, yeah. And that was, uh, they, you know, probably around, I don't know, seven or eight, something like that. They started really bringing it in and it was starting to get complex and complicated. I started tying flies at nine and it really, right before that, it's when it started clicking. We're, we're rolling rocks. We've been doing that, rolling rocks and looking at bugs a little bit and matching up colors and that kind of thing, size, shape, and color, shaking bushes and that type of stuff, catching caddis and maize that are flying out of there and smoking them over and matching them up. But then uh, they started into the entomology of it. My grandpa knew all the Latin, and he, he, it was ridiculous the amount of stuff he knew. And he would pass that on, and he would tell me the common name of what we call it here. He'd call it the mountain name. He was like, all right, the mountain name is this, and this is the fly we tie it from. This is who ties this fly. This is so and so's pattern. It was invented here, and tells me about the history of these things. Mm. So I mean, like like here in Bryson City, we have several patterns that are uh, actually one that's really popular. It's all around America. We call them a girdle bug here. Everybody else calls them Pat's rubber legs. That bug was invented in Bryson City in 1934 by a fellow named Fred Hall, and started out as a uh, rubber leg stonefly, black wool body with little white rubber legs. And uh, he was trying to find some rubber legs that were small and kind of get kind of the movement and things he was looking for, and uh, his wife's old girdle was there hanging on the back of the chair. It was just or back of something, I don't know. But anyway, the old girdle was over there. Kind of wore out some of those little frazzled pieces or elastic cord sticking through that. He just reached and grab a few of those things and pull them out of there and cut those things loose. And here's these great little small round rubber legs. Mm-hmm. Ties that in there and starts fishing with those things. And somebody, the tail is, this fella comes up to him over on Deep Creek. He's like, Mr. what's that you fishing with? He said, oh, that's my, he said, that's my new fly. I said, that's my girdle bug. I said, your girdle bug? And he said, yeah, I made that out of Eileen's old girdle. So, <laughs> you know, that's where this thing come from. So, uh, man. you know, it's transcended the sport. It's a heck of a fly, and there's all kinds of different colors and things. It's uh, So, you know, it was, it was done here in 34. I don't know when else it was done somewhere. And it's, you know, it's the kind of thing with flies. It's so uh, creative, subjective. Who knows where what come from? Or some old boy may think he tied this thing. And 20 years prior, somebody else was probably doing it too. And, you know, mm-hmm. it's kind of – I have my own little patterns that I do here, and I'm sure I'm not that creative. That's probably somebody else's something, too. So yeah, who knows? But that's just a cool thing about this dynamic sport. Yeah. And but, it's, I, you know, hanging out with you, I can tell that you have a big appreciation for the history of mm-hmm. this area. Is that something that you learned from your dad and grandpa? Were they like that? It is. They, they were. Um, they would talk about the uh, some of the the old fly fishermen that were here some of the guys that we have a southern appalachian fly fishing museum here now in bryson city which is awesome tremendous resource there of history and and things and a lot of that stuff was here and was around here it's like a living history all around here so uh they would tell me about these guys and different uh different things going on and uh it was really neat i mean just to learn and absorb that kind of stuff and it was something that was just i found it incredibly interesting that i just kept delving into and i everything i could find like old library books just anything newspaper stuff just you know from old microfilm stuff in the in the public library that i could get a hold of to try to learn things and they would teach you and tell you about these folks and then you know tales about them and and then i would try to find out more everything i could 
And so it's kind of a, it was a search and a quest to try to learn more um, about the history here and then the fishing and, uh, you know, just in fly fishing in general. I mean, we're kind of, it years ago, we were really isolated here before, you know, internet, things of that nature. You didn't see as much as somebody, you know, in a city might have their be able to get a hold of. And so, uh, you know, we do a lot of reading here and things. So, you know, you try to find some books on something or whatever you can get a hold of to, to absorb this stuff. And, uh, but a lot of it's just, just oral history passed down. So, how has that helped you as a guide, too? Because I would think that, you know, there's some, certain people that are really into history and it's just something they're personally interested in. Mm-hmm. But you had mentioned when we were talking earlier, too, that when you take a client out, you like to explain the history. Are, th- are there ways that you found that to help you as a fisherman and as a, a, a guide? I think so. Um, part of a, a big part of being a guide, I think, is, uh, you know, you're a lot of things for for folks and it's each day each personality with that person that you have out there kind of dictates as who you need to be for them that day and you've kind of i don't know you always kind of think you kind of a chameleon of sorts maybe you need to be a guy who wears many colors who can change colors and do what you need to do on the fly immediately Just reading people reading their faces and body language and how things are going and uh, a lot of times they want to you, know, you need to be an entertainer have some funny stories do some funny stuff for them or um, listen to things about them and ask questions about them and, and uh, but then you know you want to learn as much stuff because a lot of them are really interested here a lot of f- folks would have a the Grace Monkey Mountains National Park is uh, the most visited national park in America there's 12.1 million people a year coming to this park and they're coming here for to see how pretty it is and a lot of them want to learn a lot of things about it too and they'll be on truthfully and they ask you a lot of things I get tons and tons of questions um, so maybe a little different than uh, say like you guys in the the guide in the saw you're very focused and don't say a whole lot and there's not a whole lot of conversation because you're scanning the water with your eyes looking out over an ocean you know it's huge and out here we've got small trout streams so i'm looking for little things out there you have trout everywhere so um you know it's pretty it's pretty easy mm-hmm. to find it's not hard to find them it's kind of hard to not scare them but it's it's not hard to find them um but folks will ask a lot of a lot of questions about what's going on or hey what's this you'll see things out there in the park you'll see uh an old chimney or an old home site or, uh, you know, relics. I mean, like you go to Hazel Creek up there, there's a, there's all kinds of things all over. There's a lot of places like that in the back country. You'll see, um, before the park was formed, there was, uh, towns back there, huge towns, bigger than, bigger than Bryson city. And they're, they're all gone now. It's just, there's nothing there. A lot of that's been turned back into wilderness and, but there's still, still stuff there. So people ask about that stuff and you, you know, as a guide, you want to be able to say, you know, you don't want to say, well, I don't know what that was. It's like, Hey, let's, I want to tell them exactly what that was, who lived there. You know, hey, check out this cemeteries are walking past something's like, you know, look at this stuff, how old some of these gravestones, these markers are, or whatever, you know, the case may be. Some, you know, these cabins, some of the, you know, some of these old fishermen lived in here, some of the old folks like uh, Mark Cathy or Horace Kephart, one of the founders of the National Park. I mean, some different little things like that. This is where Kephart's, you know, house was, or even going back into some of the Native American history is Cherokee. Um, was here and I'm actually have some Cherokee in us of course and uh, so being able to know a lot of that history and things a lot of the names for our, our rivers and mountains and, and everything around here is, is all Cherokee so even able, when you tell somebody the name of a river they'll say what's what's Tuckasegee well it's a Cherokee word it's a it's slow moving like a turtle it's like Terrapin River mm. um, so it's just slow moving like a turtle because relatively this river moves slower than our, our creeks so being able to tell them what these different places mean and do and you know, they're going to ask, they ask a lot of questions about stuff like that, which maybe not, you know, guides in other areas might not see so much, but folks are here. There's so many things crammed in these mountains here. They, they ask a lot of stuff. Yeah. And, and with your family's legacy and how, how many generations have been here, um, comes that knowledge base and, and all this, the local knowledge you, you learn throughout that. Would you attribute that to some of your success as a guide? I would think so. It's, uh, I get a lot of repeat clients. Um, obviously, that's what you want in this business. You want to have a tremendous repeat base, and uh, I've been fortunate enough to where that I have that. And the uh, I've hardly fished with anybody new in the past five or six years, um, which you know it's. Uh, but they come and they ask things. They're like, "Hey, well, tell me about this. And what were you What were you telling me about um, this?" area back in here on deep creek or this area up here on hazel creek what was that you were telling me again and who was there and so you tell you know you'll you'll recant the stuff but there it comes into a lot um, people come back and they're they're interested and in, i see them come back because the, you know the fishing's fun it's great out here and we got lots and lots of other streams it's just in the park 2910 miles of water in the park 
But uh, they're curious about. They seem to be really curious about a lot of the human history and the things back here and the settlers and some of the some of the stuff like that because it's uh, things you'd see on TV or read about in a book or something. But to actually hear it's you see a lot of that stuff still here. They want to see it and maybe live it or kind of live vicariously at it or something. Yeah, that's a super reoccurring theme with Captain's Collective is the uh, the overall idea that most of your clients the first time they come to fish and catch fish Mm -hmm. and the repeat times are to fish with you and they want that experience over again and that friendship that you build with the client that's what i see a lot out here i I didn't know if it was that way with other folks i assumed it might be but that's uh that's what i found personally that that goes on here it's uh you form some really good bonds with folks i mean some of these there's just great incredible people that I, i get to spend my day out here with it's it's neat i mean there's a there's folks that book this i've got a tons of them I mean, i'm sure every captain does um every year some folks that i have have a stand-in date it's the third saturday ever may or, or third, third saturday ever march I have a, a father and son that come out here and fish with me and uh we're all tennessee volunteer fans here man i bleed orange and uh go vols so we all wear our tennessee stuff and here we go you guys are grinning probably florida state fans right <laughs> i'm yep. just grinning Gators. too because every time i ever hunt in tennessee public or private land i gotta wear to that orange anyway and i'm That's starting it. to think it's a conspiracy <laughs> it, it might be we we gotta do what we gotta <laughs> I, do right? yeah I, I think i'm i think i just put together some puzzle pieces on the tennessee hunting code but you might have That's a you might have cracked the code there yeah but it's it's fun. We always say we can catch two more fish wearing a ball shirt. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, and, and I'm Wizards surprised tree. they don't pick you off, you know, and spot you with that big old. Man, I'm telling you, they they love orange. Apparently, yeah. It's, uh, I guess they do. There's a few patterns around here that's got some orange in them. We won't tell them too much about it, but that's it. That's it. With, with you too, I think it's interesting. Now you're not just a guide. And I want to talk about, you got your captain's license too. I want to talk about that in a minute. But you're not just a guide, but you're also overseeing the store. I'm sure that has its own challenges. But you also have 17 guides. 16. 16. 16. 16. I just signed Josh up in my head. So (laughs) he had a good day. You don't. (laughs) You do not want me. Yeah. But, uh, you know, what are some of the things that, as you try to expand and you try to teach these younger guides, what are some things that you're really trying to instill in them? The biggest thing is, uh, I look for, when I'm hiring a new guy, I look for personality. I can teach you fishing and, uh, a lot of these guys are great fishermen anyway that come to pursue this. You don't really see a guy that can't fish that says, I'm going to be a guide. You just don't see that. Um, I know a lot of times other guides will, that's kind of the common thing. Oh, this guy can't fish or whatever. Mm-hmm. And that's, it's not the case. It, these, the guys that come out and want to do this, most all can really throw it down before they decide, Hey, I'm going to try to stake my living on this. It's kind of, you know, I'm going to starve to death. Just nobody's going to go after that. If they suck at it. Mm-hmm. Um, but you look for personality. So I want somebody that's got a, 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 just a great personality and you can't teach somebody that they're either born with it and they have it or they don't. That's just kind of the, it's just it. I mean, there's no other way around it. So I'll look for that. And then I'm instilling them that, you know, Hey, they're, they're coming to fish, you know, they're just like you said a minute ago, it's uh, they're coming to fish the fishery the first time. And that's great. You got to know the fishery and know what's going on with it and put them on a fish, you know, give them every opportunity in the world. They've got to capitalize on the strikes that they get. The trout here are stupid fast. So, um, I guess that's when you guys see a lot of the salt guys. You, I know I've been on the deck of some flats boats before. It says, don't set the hook like a trout fisherman. And yeah. my God, I, I you should have seen it. me today though. I wish I could set the hook better today, <laughs> man. I had a guy hanging out I with me. I strip set so many <laughs> trout today. <laughs> I was pulling them out fast. Yeah. They're, yeah, they were, before I even understood what happened, I'd already missed two or three, you know, I mean, just before it could register for me, but you're saying that you can't, you can't teach somebody how to have a certain type of personality. I mean, no. what's that personality like that you're looking for? You know, want somebody that's warm and genuine. That's the first thing that's talkative, that's warm and genuine. I mean, uh, you know, one of the things I, I really look for right off the bat is uh, how well that guy greets me and uh, how warm and genuine is. Do I feel like he's wanting to talk to me, that he's, you know, wanting to be out here and hang out and, and you know, and get along with people? And that's uh, right there. And usually within a two-minute conversation, I mean, of course, you know, we – interviews are lengthy of obviously um and usually within about two minutes of it i can tell right off the bat if a guy's got the personality i'm looking for or not it's mm-hmm. uh i have a a background in the casino and i when i first started guiding i, I worked in the casino at harris and uh, harris caesar's entertainment and uh, that was huge up there and so um, i used a lot of the background that i learned up there 
as far as building relationships with people. And I kind of had it naturally, but then you, you learn more things about it and learn more things to teach people. And so uh, that's kind of what I'm looking for those guys. I mean, I want somebody that's warm and friendly and that can carry on a conversation. You can, not just one person, but you can carry on a conversation with a, you know, a, somebody's grandmother or carry on a conversation with a head of state or other, with a congressman or a senator or mm -hmm. something. I mean, we got everybody in the world. You never know from day to day who you got on the water. Um, but you've got to have somebody that's got a personality to be able to get along with anybody or anybody for a given length of time. I mean, you don't have to get along with them for the next week and a half, but if you can get along with this person, have fun with them for eight hours a day or 10 or whatever, fantastic. And so, uh, you know, if you have somebody that's surly and quiet and doesn't talk and not really engaging or, you know, asking open-ended questions or, uh, you know, just a warm general feeling. I mean, we always, we talk about the Southern hospitality thing down here and we have some of this mountain hospitality here and we're a little bit more so than the, the southern thing we're a little bit more open and more friendly about it so mm -hmm. um that's kind of that's kind of the things i'm looking for it's uh one of i'm looking for a really just great outgoing personality there do you see a lot of commonalities that younger guides have that are actually a barrier to them succeeding you know it's, there's um it's almost a sense of uh i hate uh, gosh I hate to say it, it's almost like a sense of entitlement sometimes. Um, and I don't mean that in a, a, a bad way necessarily. I mean, it's, a, you know, they, they know where they want to go. They know what the end game is. It, that they're, they, they have an idea in their head where they want to end up and where they want to be. But a lot of them expect that they're going to do it now or in three months or six months or a year. And, you know, my God, there's guys over, there's loads of us out there for 20 years. And here we are just now arriving at some of these points. And these guys think, hey, i being here for three months i'm going to be right there it's like no cat you're not it's gonna it's gonna take some time you got to work put your dues in and you gotta you got to work hard and really hard and uh, no matter what i mean the the sorriest days to be out there is a 33 day and it won't snow it's just gonna rain sideways on you and it's miserable and it's uh you know how many of them you getting under your belt how long you how long you working out here you know what you're going to dig out of down there when you guys are it gets up over 100 degrees of a day i promise you i'm i'm done this 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 country boy will melt down there where you guys are it gets about 85 degrees i can't even think mm -hmm. so I, i'd be a terrible salt guy. no worries i'm not coming to every guy <laughs> 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 um, not happening i've got to i got to be up here in it's cold water but uh you know you gotta you gotta put your time in and you see those guys not wanting to not want to do that as much work they're kind of i don't know i'm sometimes you don't see the work ethic there and uh that's one of the things that i that i notice a lot of times is uh that and then if they uh a lot of them will resort to uh doing other things like trying to get inside somebody else's head on the water things like that or the little mm -hmm. i don't know the little god war thing stuff like that we don't have those it's uh you know i tell a lot of our guys just be nice around everybody be professional always take that high road always be the always be the better guy just be nice go on Give them room if a drift boat crowds you down the river. So it's not like where you guys are in the ocean. Everybody's got big, you know, it's a big place. You're still going to spots and things. Um, but out here we're all on a water, and it might be 200 yards wide or it might be 75 yards wide, and we're trying to run 15 drift boats down at some time. So, you know, it gets out there and gets a little a little crowded, that kind of thing. You just keep your cool and be be nice, be observant. If somebody's fishing where you wanted to be, just go some hits hit another one. That's just part of knowing the water that you're on and knowing where everything's at and having, you know, plan A, B, C, D, you know, mm -hmm. being able to do that. So a lot of times the, the younger guys won't have that or have the patience to sit back and take that in and do the appropriate measures at times. Um, Josh and I were talking about that today. We were driving in. We were driving down the road and we saw like five or six drift boats right on top of each other. Mm -hmm. And we were kind of saying that look kind of looks like a tarpon flat when people are tarpon fishing. <laughs> they got all those boats out there and, you know, but it's interesting that you mentioned that about plans B, C, D. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times, I guess, when I'm thinking about fishing out in a river or creek, you know, I'm thinking about being kind of remote right. and not expecting to see anybody. But what right. I've noticed kind of around here in some of the different areas is it can get a little crowded in certain parts. What does it look like for you and as you teach this to your guides to be good at creating great plan B's, grant plan C, plan D? Like, what does that process look like for you? Um, f for us, it's, uh, it's really complex. I mean, we got, uh, we got on 5,600 miles of streams and creeks, and uh, that's staggering when you sit and think about that. 
the um, some of the crowded stuff you guys have seen has been out here on the Tuckasee River, and that today has just been a busy day. Um, it's opening day of normal trout season for some things, so it brings people out of the woodwork. And uh, you might not see those fishermen all year long, but then today here they are. It's like the January 1st gym thing. Yeah. Everybody starts getting back in the gym. That's it. Yeah, it's everybody got to get to the gym. Action. And it was 72 degrees today. It was a beautiful oh, day man, today. Yeah. I can't I can't blame any fair weather people for coming out today. It was oh, gosh, incredible. No, not at there all. There are people just sitting by some of the rivers around town, mm-hmm. just sitting there, not even fishing, just sitting in a chair. That's it. They were. And that, that's it's incredible to see, you know, at times it's uh, – it's sometimes you just got to take a breath and be like, hey, this is see we're here. This is it, it, it's that old adage. It is what it is. Just, uh, you know, you're, you're here. That's what's going on. Just mm-hmm. deal with it. Um, for us, uh, a lot of times and most often, because most of our stuff is not out here on the big rivers like the Tuckasegee, it's, it's back in the Smoky Mountains National Park. And there's nothing but solitude back there. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of a rule of thumb out there. She, you walk in about 30, 40 minutes, man, you don't see a soul. If you see somebody walk another 20 minutes and you got it to yourself. And you'll have to yourself all day. We hit most of the time. We don't see another fisherman back there unless we're just one of the really like a trailhead or something like that. You'll pass a few guys and everybody gives their nod and you see them covering their fly up on their rod. And it's like, man, it don't make a difference. <laughs> you can't see it from here anyway. <laughs> exactly. We're little, I can't see it in my, t- in my own hand right in front of me hardly. I definitely can't see it across the and stream. I know. That's what I get a kick. I always get a chuckle out of it. I was like, guys, that, that that flies less than a quarter of an inch. I'm not going to see that thing 40 feet away or hanging on your rod to know exactly what it is. I can see, hey, that's a fly, but I have no clue what he's got tied on there. But they're just secretive like that. It's kind of hilarious. I guess fishermen are fishermen like that everywhere. Um, but you can, in the park, you can find just tons of solitude. That's one of the big draws for that with folks. There's uh, 2,910 miles of water there. There's only 900 miles of trails in the park. So, you know, 2,000 miles, that doesn't even have a trail around. So that's where most folks um, kind of get boogered off. You get a lot of folks that, as, as visitors would be, I mean, I was uh, kind of like this going out west out there around the Grizzlies and stuff like that. You don't want to venture too far away to get out of your comfort zone. It's all about what your comfort zone is and what you're willing to do. And most folks have about the same kind of comfort zone on that kind of thing, whether mm-hmm. they want to admit it or not. And um, I don't know, there's nothing in these woods we're afraid of. So there's nothing back here going to eat you. So... We just keep motoring on and keep going, and, you know, you can find some just, I don't know, there's days that you swear that somebody's never even fished a stream that you've been on because of how crazy the action could be out there. So mm-hmm. it's just um, willing to put the time in and get there. Um, and I'd love to share that with all the clients that we have. Some just want to come in on a half-a-day trip because they're new to this. We teach a lot of beginners, and uh, they're not going to get back to the really far back country things and get worse. Just it's ridiculously good. They'll they'll see some good fishing, of course, but they never really get to experience that. Oh my God, this is the best day of my life fishing. Um, the way to do that is to book a you know do a full day trip. And you can get back to the the really good stuff. And then we do you know back country overnight kind of. We do lots of those things like back country camps where mm-hmm. we get really back into the deep real smokies, the core of it. And those are some just epic days. The guys coming out of there, they get done. The the guides usually take the day off after that trip because you've walked so much and clambered over so much stream mm-hmm. and boulders out here and fighting the current that you you need the day off the next day. But the clients call you out two days later and they're like, my God, I can barely move. That's the best time of my life. And it's mm-hmm. like, yes, that's what you wanted. Um, they got to see the real deal, see what, what we really have here. So. It's kind of it's kind of neat. Yeah, we experienced a little bit of that yesterday. We went up in the park and we're climbing on boulders and trees, and <laughs> we're still, you know, we're Florida boys, so we're still learning how to read the rocks. That's what I call it, reading the rocks. Because yeah. you look and you say, "There's a big rock right there. I bet I can walk on that. It's big, it's flat, and you step on that thing, and it's slimy, man. It is slick." <laughs> so I, I like the small rocks and the sand, but absolutely, you know, I, I would imagine that you know, you talk about a plan B, but it's like you have this sense where you go out and maybe there's a guide there, mm-hmm. but then you might go out too. And I know this is the case with other guides, saltwater, freshwater, etc., where you bring somebody out and you're going to have to go to plan B because that person's capabilities are not where you thought they that were. Is exactly. Maybe they can't, maybe they can't handle those boulders. Maybe they can't, maybe they told you that they could cast Right but now they're they're in the trees every other cast and you're like we're gonna have to get to a wider i mean wh- right. how do you work through that when you have a, an angler whose capabilities are somewhat limiting for various reasons how do you try to work through that that's a great question i like that um 
we size up. We I tell our guys every morning we size folks up. I mean, we I talk to them on the phone and try to try to kind of. I don't know, it's not filter it, but you're just trying to kind of size it up a little bit right there on what the conversation is at booking a trip. I, I talk with them a little bit and spend a little bit of time with everybody that's on the phone that, that calls with us to book a trip. It's usually 10 to 15 minutes to book a trip at least, and you know, because mm-hmm. they're talking a little bit about what they want to do and what they want to accomplish with their trip. And uh, all the guides know when, he, when they show up there, you, uh, you, know, you size them up and look, can this person get there? How, how old are they? How fit are they? You know, are, are they very overweight? Or they look like they're in pretty good shape? Can they get to where I wanted to go today? What I thought was the great fishing was, and if they can't, where else do we go? You know, if you got other streams, it's okay. This stream, there's different places on different creeks are, are great, and they'll have easier sections to wade and things like that. That might be the other sections that everybody goes to as well. That it's easy for them to get to. They're going to be like, all right, let's fish this. And so you're you're having to take these folks there. That's might not be some of the most spectacular water in the world, but you got to be able to catch a fish there. So that's when coming into play where being a great angler comes into play. It's not that you, it doesn't matter how many fish I can catch when I go out. It's how many fish can I get you to catch when I'm out with you? Mm-hmm. You know, how can I get that stuff conveyed to you to be able to get you to successful so you have and feel like you had a great day out there? And then at the end of the day, it's something I feel good about myself. And, man, I did the best in the world I could for them. I think they had a good time today. And so you, you've got to have different streams in your back pocket and that's kind of the, the beauty of where we're at we have so much water here it's really easy for us to move somewhere else i mean super easy we meet here at the shop or at a couple of different locations and it's so simple just to, when you see that person be like ah we need to go here today or we need to go to this stream or heck yeah i've got somebody that can do what i can do let's go have some fun today mm-hmm. and then you get to go to plan a that you wanted to do and so um you know, we, we have all that stuff and all of our guides, we sit back and talk about different streams and different sections. We have a, we have a group chat that goes every afternoon as things have been blowing up all day. Um, and we talk about the conditions for the day and what's going on and who's coming up next. And if some of these folks have booked three and four days with us in a row, it's on our reservation system. So we know, you know, how many days are in, who's, who's fishing with them next. We kind of convey that, Hey, this guy has a trick knee or this fellow broke an ankle last year. This guy's got a bad back. This guy just had back surgery and we're all scared for that. It's like, Oh my gosh, you know, we, we sure don't want somebody to fall like that. So we're putting them on the easier to wade stuff for what they can get to. Or if we've got, you know, somebody's little kid that was kind of scared or something like that, you know, it's like, Hey, we can, get to something easy for them and we always have different places to that can go we have so much a such a variety of water that we it's it's pretty easy for us to to pull something up and have another you know plan d mm-hmm. for for different things and uh sometimes you have to do that with weather we're a, a temperate rainforest here it's uh it's absolutely ridiculous how much rain we get here one of the areas where our private water is last year got 151 cubic or 151 inches of rain last year 151 inches of rain that's insane and wettest record on year on record last year. So you really got mm-hmm. some. And the things with the mountains is one side of the mountain will get a lot of rain, the next one won't get nothing. Then it could be mm-hmm. on the same mountain range or the same the same mountainside, just you know north, south, east, west facing, what have you. That one's not going to get as much as the other one. So those creeks won't blow out as much. Mm-hmm. And you know from which way the paths that uh, different storms take, like spring storms or summer storms, or, you know, our summer stuff's a lot of pop-ups like you guys get in Florida. They just kind of, we get a day over about 75 here, you can bet your tail it's going to have a pop-up around about by 2 o'clock today, and it's going to be a frog strangler for 30 minutes, and then it's going to come out, sun's going to pop out, it's going to be hotter than the surface of the sun. Mm-hmm. And so you kind of, you plan on that stuff, and you know, hey, this always blows up quicker, or this one doesn't, this mm-hmm. one stays in shape better, and, you kind of use that stuff to your advantage, but it just kind of goes back to local knowledge and passing information down from, from you know, for decades as to what what's going to do good for you and what's not, and what kind of conditions that yeah. X, Y, or Z. And you guys have so many different conditions. That was something that mm-hmm. stood out to me. And you were talking about, you know, we're in the shop right now, and behind you is just a, a fishing report board. It's got you know maybe ten or so different different creeks and rivers, and you guys use text messaging, group text. That's pretty common. Are there different mm-hmm. things that you guys do to try to kind of share that type of information kind of day of other than is it group texting, app, email? I mean, what? how do you guys do that? You know, we're kind of, I guess I'm kind of the not the most tech savvy guy out there. I would, you know, I never have claimed to be. So we don't use like the WhatsApp thing. I saw it the other day. I was like, oh, that's cool. But I hadn't tried it. The... uh we just kind of send that stuff out. A lot of times of the morning, I'm coordinating things too. Now that I'm in the shop so much, instead on the water with everybody, mm-hmm. even it was happening a lot too when I was on the water right there at the start. My usually when I meet clients of the morning, we a lot of times we start here 
you don't have to start the crack of dawn out here. You start around 8 o'clock. You want the bugs to start moving light, coming up, and fish start getting active. So that's kind of nice. When nobody has to get out of bed at the crack of dawn. We can also stay and have that second cup of coffee and then come show up and go fish. You know, or everybody's feeling good. Um, my day when I meet with folks, mine starts about, would start about 15 minutes later of everybody else because we're I'm coordinating things and helping. So the guides are calling me. They're like, hey, river levels at this or creek levels at this. All right, this is what I'm thinking. Is this what, it, what you think? And I was like, it is. Or I'll say, hey, try this. I, I believe this one right here is going to go because of X, Y, Z. And so we'll make some purposes and mm-hmm. spur the moment decisions like that. But after a after a while, um, everybody gets to where they know this stuff because of his, history. History repeats itself. So it's it's here. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I had the same kind of condition two weeks ago, and this is what works here, what there for whatever. If this stream blows out or this one blows out, or we got this massive rain event that could happen all the time here in the mountains. You can wait, go to bed at night and it's a clear blue sky and you wake up at six or at 2 a.m and your metal roof on your log cabin's raising hell and you can't even sleep because of it's, <laughs> it's raining yeah. you just got three and a half inches of rain overnight yeah. and it's like what do you do with that and uh so we're you know everybody's all i don't know our guys have been with us quite a while most of them so mm-hmm. they're pretty used to being able to change on the fly like that so we kind of keep everything kind of loose for us i mean we we have all these things in our head of where we're going to go and what we're going to do but you know, we also know, hey, we there's a chance if something happens, we're going to this one or going to this stream here, or switching up to this different rigs, this different techniques, that kind of thing. It's a uh, that's one of the things as, as being a trout guide. My gosh, I know when you open up a saltwater box, y'all have quite a few flies in there, and you see a lot of the same stuff, maybe 10, 15 different types of patterns. It seems like a lot of times you open up one of our boxes, there's probably four hundred different patterns in there, and you know, two or three dozen of each one. It's like good lord, it's the bugs, but it's because there's so much stuff going on. And everything's all seasonal too. I mean, at some points in time, there's 35, 40 different things hatching off at once, and a trout might key in on one certain stage of that emergence of that insect, and hell, you better have it. Or it's going to be a long day. Yeah. Um, so you just kind of you've got to be ready to be dynamic, move quick. Josh with it. experienced that, <laughs> dude. That blows dude. my mind. Yeah, it's That's, crazy. It, well, one of the things too that we really wanted to talk to about with you, and there's a lot of guides who are thinking about having people kind of go underneath them and what was it like for you to go from just being yourself as a guide to having one or two people, however you did it underneath you. Mm -hmm. And then what are some ways that you've kind of keyed in on scaling up and trying to maintain quality? And I mean, I have so many thoughts through my head about, do you tell them what river to go to and how much are you monitoring? Could you just tell us a little bit about what it looks like for you to run the different guides out of here? Sure. Um, most of the day, most of the time, my day's pretty chaotic because of things like that. Um, I have a huge sense of responsibility because, um, you know, when I first started doing this, and then I got some, you know, so it was friends of mine that I knew that that fished and were great fishermen, and I thought would be great guys, and we fished together a lot. And uh, I would start, you know, needing some overflow work and things like that. And I was like, hey, can you help me out on this trip here? I've got some. They're wanting to bring a, a bigger, you know, more people than I can take. I, I'll, I'll limit us to three people per per guide on a wading trip. That's just bottom line. That's just it. Um, I don't want to dilute that experience. I want everybody to have a great time and have a great experience. And just, you know, no more than three people per guy. That's just reasonable. You have a great experience like that. You start cramming things in there and you see a lot of one or two man shows and mm-hmm. operations. You'll see those guys out there, 10 to 12 people. And it's like, oh, bless their hearts. They're going to have a rough day today with not the guy, but the client. It's going to be a bad, ex- you know, it's not going to be yeah. a great experience as it could be for them. And, um, so we'd start bringing, you know, some of my friends on to help me with some of these things. We're catching bigger groups and stuff. And then, uh, Next thing he's always like, hey, I'd like to get into this a little bit more. You know, it's like, well, I'd like to expand what I'm doing. So the um, let's just try this. But then you're, is, there's this whole sense of responsibility because now you're not responsible for whether or not your kids eat, but whether or not that fella's kids eat. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, that's a that's a huge thing to swallow. If you sit back and look at it, if you truly are a good human being and care for other people, it's you're going to worry about that guy and his family, whether or not you, well, he's got enough work or not. And uh, I have, uh, you know, a lot of guides like that. They have families, have little kids and things, and they've got, you know, bills to pay and mouths to feed. And you've got to make sure you're doing everything you can do to make sure they're busy and have enough work that they can take care of their family. So um, I'm kind of really hard on myself on that kind of thing. I look out a lot of days and um, with my competitors when I, I look out and say one of my guides didn't have a trip that day and I look out and somebody else does and from another company, and I'm like, okay, I'm a failure today. I failed. My guy didn't have work. They did. Why did they book with them instead of us? Where did I mess up at? Did I miss a phone call? Did I miss an email? Or 
what was where was my missed opportunity here that I could have had work for my man right here and so it's not so much as it's a like people would think it's like a greed thing oh my gosh I want to make a lot of money fly fishing man as long as I can feed kids that's that's, that's all I'll care if I can make a living at it I, I don't want to get rich I don't aspire to be that way so just taking care of your own and if you bring another guy on that's the biggest thing for me is to, to worry about is can i keep him sustained and you know when i turn away a pile of trips constantly it's like yes i can keep him busy and that's when i decide to hire someone else on but i want to i want to make sure that i can keep them all busy so as, as we expanded and i learned more about uh one of the things for me was uh helping us to expand was i learned how to do my own websites and to, to build my own stuff. And uh, years ago, I was getting this stuff done, hiring it out, and it's pretty expensive. But then, you know, a couple of decades ago, the internet looked pretty rough from compared to what it does today, and it was really hard to understand some of that stuff. So I sat back and I was like, well, man, I've had a couple college degrees here. I couldn't be too dumb. Let's see if I can figure this stuff out. So and it, it made a difference for me to be able to expand and, and work well and, and get out there and be seen where people would say, hey, yes, let's go take a trip with these guys. And... um it's just it's just a whole process lots of lots and lots of moving parts in there to do it and it's a it's a whole lot of worry it's a i've got a lot of gray hair now and it's uh it's from that i'm 43 and i've got a bunch on the sides here man it's like mm -hmm. what the world but it's it's probably from worrying i think it's uh you know worrying about hey are these guys are gonna be busy i keep them working that kind of thing and i do and it's uh it's been great they you know beg you know i let them set their own schedule but a lot of times they'll forget to block a day off right there next thing you know he's working for four weeks straight and he's like my god i need a day off somewhere i didn't block something out and you gotta shuffle around and find it for him but then on the flip side it's like heck yeah i'm doing my job right today i got us mm -hmm. all busy everybody's got work and mm -hmm. everybody's busy every day that they want to work on and, I, and i'm doing my job right so I'm, I'm real critical on myself as far as uh you know keeping up with you know making sure i'm taking care of them and uh and keeping them busy out there and that's uh I don't know. That's, not, that's, my, that's my biggest worry in this thing. It's not whether or not if, uh, you know, if it goes under, if the economy, we all worry about the economy, obviously, things like that. But um, it's just mostly as I, I want to take care of the guys I've got. You know, I'd hate to, I've never had to, but I'd hate to come up and say, hey, man, I'm going to have to let you go. I just can't keep you busy. Or mm -hmm. have a guy saying, hey, I, I just can't stay busy with you. I'm going to have to go somewhere else. They've never done that. Mm. Um, they're usually coming up and going, my gosh, man, can I have a day off? Yeah. <laughs> so, that's the better conversation. And that's right. Have. That's right. And I can tell that you, I mean, you said you're hard on yourself, but I can tell you take a lot of ownership in what you do around here. Right. And I think even the way that you talked about, if you go out and there's somebody else on your, you know, the place that you wanted to fish, I mean, it's very obvious that whether you're personally talking about yourself and how you'd approach a situation or how you approach your business or the fly shop, that you take a lot of ownership, that it's not things happening to you, but okay, this is what it is and I'm going to own this and I'm going to move on to the next thing. Do you try to instill that too in the younger guides? Do you find that to be a, a challenge? I do. Um, most of the time they're pretty much up to it. I mean, I talk to them very extensively when, uh, when they get started with us, you know, we have multiple conversations. I try to take all these guys under my wings and, uh, and, and try to you know make a you know put it where they can understand everything that happens and you know try to get them to help you know be the best guide they can possibly be and help them get their careers and where they want to go some of them come here and stay for a couple of years with us and they say hey i want to go guide while i'm young before i get married and go guide out west and i'm like well man these are some of the challenges you're going to face out there i have a lot of friends that guide out there and have outfitters and um this is what they're looking for out of a guide and this is what i look for out here and you know this is the kind of things that they do and the challenges they face so I try to keep them prepared for everything that possible scenario, what they want to do professionally and personally, both. And you know, if, as long with the lines with what I need them to be out here where we're at, mm -hmm. the, the task on hand here. Um, to work out here for us, you've got to be very, very versatile. We fish tailwaters and little spring creeks, little mountain freestones. It's, uh, we do some stuff on the lakes and it's, every day is different for these guys he's not just on one body of water they're not just floating the tuck of cg out here just wading the nantahala they're you know we got two states and 11 mountain towns i mean we're everywhere and they've got to be ready to you know this morning to be on once be in north carolina guiding this afternoon be in tennessee and so they've got to be ready to be, you can work for this outfit you got to be ready to work and move. full speed you've got you've got to it's wide open and it's uh 
and they, you know, I, I look for that in them. They've got to have some spunk, some fire in them. They got to be pretty fit. I mean, you're pretty, pretty, pretty fit in doing what they're doing. I know it's a. You have little physicals that you make them do, kind of. No, little, I'm, they probably <laughs> show little, me up. Little exercises, <laughs> and let me see you climb up on that stool real quick and balance on one leg for a year. Yeah, and we thank goodness they don't have to do that. I'd fall off the stool. We don't have holding platforms. Thank <laughs> God. I'd, I see those, and I'm like, oh yeah, I'd break my neck off that thing. Um, no, it's just a. Uh, it's either going to make you or break you out here. I mean, there's some of our boats that we row that are just absolutely, one of them we call it the, the, the big cat, and everybody hates that boat. It's just this huge cat raft that's a, it's like a gear boat they use out west on like the Oahe or the Salmon Fork. And I mean, I got that thing I'll make a man out of, and it'll do it pretty quick. It's a, it's a beast, and you, you kind of, <laughs> they all look at kind of intimidated to hear the other guys fuss about it sometimes. Like, yeah. God, I got to take that boat today. And I was like, boys, I rode that boat for five or six years. And Upstream all, both ways. Well, it's, you know, it's a, <laughs> you, isn't a drift boat. You're rowing backwards yeah. all day, so you're rowing upstream, but trying to slow it down. But the, uh, you know, I'm like, I took that thing forever. I said, there for a few years, I didn't look like I had a neck back here. So my shoulders were so big. It's ridiculous. But I was like, it'll, it'll either make you or break you. And uh, they get out there and just go after it. I mean, you got to be ready to, you got to be ready to put it in. And I mean, it, the end of the night these guys don't stay up late drink party they are crashing they are done they're tying some flies and falling asleep at the table and everything else you know they're beat it's just uh it's just kind of the way it is it's uh i i hell i hardly have a night that i don't fall asleep at the kitchen table tying some flies for for the shop in here for the next day i mean or for trips you know when i'm on the water all the time it's uh you just you go like fighting fire and then when it's done it's done and you, you're out um so they've got to they've got to have that kind of work ethic, and that's one of the big things that I'm looking for. Also, with personality, is uh, you know, you, you got to be ready to work, got to be ready to go. If they they come in at the first hint of lazy, I'll weed them out real fast. It's uh, they'll weed themselves out. It's not that I weed them out; they'll weed themselves. It's uh, you've got to be ready to go. There's no sick days in this kind of stuff. Somebody's counting on you. There, a lot of folks that we fish with are are new to it. They're on vacations. Everybody has a strict, you know, has a timeline of hey, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this activity. And you don't want to be that guy that messes that up. We have a lot of folks that come here to fish with us. And, uh, you know, we, some of the really, I don't know, trips that mean some of the most to me, we'll get guys and say, hey, this is dad's last time fishing. He's been diagnosed with stage four cancer or something. This is probably his last, his last time out. And you can tell it, it definitely is. All the sons are there. You might have a grandsons and things with it. And you want to be that guy that messed that up. I mean, you want to be that guy that, Played out the night before, drank a couple too many cold beers, or got up next morning's like, nah, I'm not coming to work, or I'm gonna about halfway do this. Heck no, man, you're gonna be the guy that makes that happen. And they're like, that's a memory right there for us for the rest of our lives. And that's what we do is we create memories for folks. That's what we're that's what we're about. And I tell that to the guys and instill that in them. You're you're creating memories for folks, and you you don't want to mess that up and create a bad memory for them. You want it to be a great experience for them. Create some good memories. They look back on back. Man, that time in the mountains was cool. I had fun back there fishing with that guy. That old hillbilly, he was a lot of fun. You know, we enjoyed that. It was a great time. And uh, so that's kind of what you want to be is, is, is be who you need to be for those folks so they can have a great time out here and enjoy it. And if they come back, fantastic. And But you see a lot of special trips like that. I mean, you um, a lot of first-time stuff for folks, which is cool. Lots of kids. We got over a 1,000 kids a year. And, uh, well, it's like yesterday we had a kid that uh, – he stuck a brown trout that was just ridiculous. Um, you know, it's it's awesome that he done that. And in another sense, we we're all joking, going, "Man, I hate it for the kids. Everything else is going to be downhill it's from really here." From here, yeah, that's the yeah, one. Man, unbelievable. Let me see. Yeah, that thing is crazy. Kids' yeah. first trout ever. How big do you think this trout is? I don't know. Probably twenty-seven. Man, um, it's just ridiculous. Big brown trout. Big, just I don't know, kind of kind of notes and that's the first first one he's ever caught yeah, you could send like that, that to me i'll photoshop my my face on it he's <laughs> gotcha. got a similar body build to me but uh, we <laughs> one of the things we want to do too just kind of as we we wrap up is just kind of do some fun rapid fire questions about just different thoughts that we have and and things uh i'll go ahead and lead out the gate so you got your captain's license but that's that's not very common is it and it's not for what we do it's nothing that i I don't really need them. I don't do anything that uh, that that really requires it at all. I mean, the uh, I just it's something I wanted to do. I mean, I don't go by Captain Eugene at all. It's all my bio stuff on the website, mm -hmm. of course. But it's not a. I don't. know. It's just one of those professional things that you want to do. It's something that 
you're, as a guide, you want to be the best you can be and keep just sharpening yourself and making you trying to do everything you can do to push yourself to be better, to, to help and have more knowledge and things of that nature. And that was just another, just another stone to do that. I mean, it's a great thing. I'm glad that's there. It's really cool. Um, a lot of remembering, th- you know, a lot of a lot of remembering things, that kind of thing. Then I'll freak out over the test, of course, like everybody does. Like, oh my God, what if I fail this thing? But um, it's nothing that I use. I mean, I, I, the boats I use out here, we don't have motors. It's the motors you, and so it's just not required to run a river with that. It's just something to do. Yeah. Um, just something else to have that you know. Hey, what if one day they came up and said, Hey, everybody run these rivers out here's got to have a captain's license. Well, all right, I've got mine. That's You're ready. Fine. That's yeah. it. So it's kind of cool. So uh, we talked about your your time as a guide. You said twenty four years, twenty three, twenty three. Yeah. Um, what pushed you to open up a shop, open up an outfitter? I know it's a more recent endeavor. Right. Um, one of the things is is a guide service up here um, because of fly shops. I don't know if it works that way with you guys in Florida because everybody's just looking for a guide. There's not so much fly shops down there. It's just you're finding guides and charters and captains up here. It's not that way, everybody searches up the fly shops, looking for the fly shop, and there's where the guides are. They can't be a great guide or a real guide if they don't have a fly shop. And I didn't hear that a lot, but I heard it enough to where I was like, "That's I don't want that happening to us. Again, that falls back on me being taking all the responsibility on myself mm-hmm. is to do everything I can do to keep my guys as busy as they can be. And, you know, my little hometown, I looked at it for years and thought, man, should I do one, should I not? I don't know. And I was like, it just didn't feel right. And... uh Back in the summer, uh, this building here, my wife and I had talked about it a couple of times. We'd actually put a, a we had a building we were going to lease over in Gatlinburg, and uh, they had a big wildfire over there. It was just epic. It was all over the news and things. Um, the building we were that we were planning on burned in that fire, mm. and I was like, "That's a sign we shouldn't do this." I was like, all right, "I'm backing away because I'm, you know, I'm always cautious about things. I'm overly cautious most of the time." Um, so I said, I, "I'm just not going to do it." So. Uh, but then the opportunity came to have this one. Some folks that we go to church with when my whole life, they own this building here, this whole strip thing. And uh, it was like, well, you know, they've got this building. I hear it's fixing to be open. So I, I asked them, and they said, yeah, it is. And I said, well, I'd love to have that building. He said, what do you want to put in there? And I kind of wanted, you know, I'd wanted a fly shop. Obviously, deep down, that's what I wanted to do. And I thought, well, maybe I can open something for my wife or something. She wants like a little women's boutique or something. Her and my daughter can have do something mm-hmm. with that. And I was like, man, could one town support two fly shops? Because there's already a little fly shop here. It started a couple of years ago for some, you know, it, it, about three years ago, I guess it opened. But uh, I was like, can can one shop support, you know, one town support more shops? So we go to a vacation out west Yellowstone. There's like nine shops out there. Mm-hmm. And the little town looks just about like the same kind of size, same kind of thing, park right there, same, you know, a lot of similarities. As soon as I saw that, I was like, you know what? Yeah, it can. I mean, we've got a huge guide service. We take care of a lot of folks. I'm just going to concentrate on taking care of our people and our clients. I'm not worried about the the culture, the bro scene of the whole thing, the coolness of the fly fishing, the whole hipster kind of whatever's going on there. It's um, I wanted mine to be authentic and what's here and what's real and what people would need if they're coming up here for the Smokies. So if they're they're coming here to fish for a day, you know, we we've, we've got what they need for the day. I don't care a lot of. I don't carry hardly any expensive stuff in here because somebody's on vacation. They're not buying that. They're either going to get something to get some through for the day, for the weekend, for the vacation or whatever. And then, uh, you know, take care of what we need for what our clients would be looking for to come in with us. Cause it's uh, a lot of times it'd be on the water. Guys like, Hey man, I buy some shirts or some hats from me. I didn't have any of that. I have the only thing tangible I've got for them, some photos of a trip. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I need something a little bit more than that. So it was, uh, it was kind of a, Kind of a neat little decision to do. It was like, hey, let's do this thing. It'll be fun. Um, you know, and then, too, I'm getting older, um, 43, which is not old. But after you run over 6,000 float trips down the river, your shoulder tells you you're, you're not young yeah. anymore. I've got one of those trick rotator cuffs now. Thank you. Um, but the uh, I was like, all right, this is the next transition, I guess, for me. Um, I'd seen it happen with some friends of mine out west. And I was like, you know, this is – the transition it looked like they went into and it looks like what i need to do so uh, so far it's been fun I mean, we've had a good time with it it's uh it's definitely been an education and experience and uh and it's an experience i'd repeat and do it again i mean it's uh it's kind of cool i see my kids coming in here now they're hanging out a lot and helping in here a little bit and then you see their friends coming in a lot there's a school that's out here i might have 15 20 of those kids from the high school in here hanging out with with my kids and they're all getting interested in fly fishing because right here it is in them and so i'm like hey, cool, I can get more kids into the sport. Just tell them about this stuff. And, you know, they're like, hey, grandpa's got a rod or dad's got a rod. Or I'm like, 
get him to take you fishing. Go out there and do this, kid. You need to do this. Keep, you know, pass that torch down here. Let's you guys need to get the end of this sport too. So you got you're living the place for it. So it's been it's been a lot of fun. It's been a, a lot of different things. So it's been a great experience so far. I hate to uh, change the whole vibe of this, but you're in a guide mode. So you sent me and Hunter to Deep Creek first, right? That's where we went, Deep Creek? Yeah. I think so. I think All so. Right, so <laughs> let's say that we did. Okay. Yeah. So, did, yeah. so we hit the bridge like we hit remember. the bridge that we got to and on the other side of the of the creek or whatever, there's like four or five cars stacked into the hillside. Do you know what I'm talking about? There's yeah, I do. What, uh, how, how did that happen? I just, yeah, the cars <laughs> and the riverbanks. That's on the tuck. There's a, um, there's a couple of places like that. <laughs> yeah, it's along the tuck of CG. What that come about, um, is I asked my dad, this is one of those things you asked him about how this stuff passed. Mm-hmm. I was just asking questions and he tell you. Um, years ago when Lyndon Bird Johnson was in office, Lady Bird Johnson had the Beautify America initiative. So they go around America, clean up the, the freeways and plant the flowers, making everything kind of pretty along the fi- the highways and the byways. Well, you know, there's a lot of old cars set around places in rural America and things like that. And they're sitting there and they're like, what are we going to do with this? They're on the sides of the state road and the state right of ways. And it's probably a state nobody claims these things in years. It's like it's all over, you know, it's places like this can play out everywhere. I mean, out west, I think there's, you know, cars stacked along riverbanks out there as well. But for here in the mountains, it's uh, it's hard to find boulders and things. I mean, some, but, you know, stabilized road banks and things, that's just uber expensive to be able to do stuff like that. So somewhere, somebody thought it was a great idea to take these old 57 Chevrolets and 64 Impalas or whatever the world and crush these things and, you know, drain the fluids out, of course, and crush them and stack them in the banks there in the river bends. And if you notice, they're always in a bend. It's where a, a high hydraulic would hit kind of washing the road stuff out so they put them there as like a riparian zone almost it's not like a not like a cool riparian zone it's not a well thought out one at the point but you know years ago they don't i don't think they thought so much about that so yeah. they put those cars along there so um that's that's how they got there and while they're there they're to stabilize that bank to keep it fall and they actually work really well i mean our county has been through a lot of stuff we're trying to uh get those out we had a some feasibility studies done obviously several you know, years back about getting those out and the epa had told us that it's going to do more damage to take those things out than it is just to leave them there and leave them alone there's no fluids in them so if it ain't just, broke don't fix it that's kind of it in that case but it's uh it's weird it's 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 odd people see it um when we float down the river sometimes i'm just sitting there scratching my head going oh my god what are they gonna think about this but then they're passing by and they're like good lord man there's an old studebaker in there look at that 50 dodge and there's a 57 chevy Are you kidding me look at the chrome on that thing and i'm like yeah, and it's in the rear. It's at the river, and the water gets up on it when the river comes up, and it's it's still chrome. It's like they don't make them like that anymore. Yeah, but uh, it's I don't know. It's kind of just a kind of an eclectic thing to see as you're floating down through there, and you never know how people are going to react. I've had yeah. over the years maybe a couple of people going, "Oh my God, what is that?" And then everybody else is like, "Well, that's cool," and they'll, they'll all ask, "Why is it there?" But that that's what it is. Yeah, if it was new cars, it wouldn't be so cool. <laughs> no, that's right. Yeah, if you see the Kia sitting Bunch there of mashed plastic. up, yeah, yeah, plastic, be like, "What is that?" But it's a uh, it's so oh, cool. You know, you just want to kind of makes you want to go yank them out of there and restore the things, you yeah. know, put some tires That's a in TV them. show. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I mean, yeah, next you can to- have at it. You can have at it with those. But, you know, one of the things you talked about was high school students coming in here and mm-hmm. hanging out. What are some things that you're intentionally trying to pass on to your son, his friends and the next generation of fly fishermen? Conservation is the biggest thing with them. Um, and that's something that, and and it's caught really, it's really caught hold with my kids. They uh, and they they're constantly they come home and tell me about this. Hey, so and so kept too many fish or they were bragging about it. And I was like, look, you know, what'd you tell them? And he was like, man, I explained it to him. You, know, you keep these things, and this is what's going to happen. There's not anything else there. You know, it, it looks like a fun thing to do. It's like, hey, I broke the law. That's cool, and it, it's not. You know, and then look look at how many eggs that fish lays and how many it can't lay now. And, you know, how many fish that's gone. And so they uh, they convey that. And you, you're starting to see it really catch on with them. I'm like, look, if you keep them, you only got to fish for it one time. It's not there anymore. Go back and fish that place again where you caught it and see if you can catch something else there. And a lot of times you're, you're not going to for a while until something else moves in there. And they're like, oh, geez, okay, yeah, I see what you mean. I was like, so if you keep doing stuff like that, it's not going to be there and you're going to mess it up. So then the place, that, the sport that you love, you're screwing it up. So just turn them back and go back and catch them. And it's a... Uh, seeing that really click with them um one of the things we have down here we have to uh, we're hooked in with our high school it's called an intern program it's got an internship and it's a whole class that they do up there and kids want to go into different fields and things they uh 
they, we we mentor to these kids down here. They come in of a morning and they work down here for a couple of hours. So they're working with the guides, they're running shuttles, helping with clients, meeting clients, talking to them, interacting with them, working in the shop. And I mean, they're doing you know, of course we'll have them sweep floors and things like that. But then they're you're helping get gear ready. They're helping a guy over here f- pick out fly selection and. The kids that kind of gravitate towards us that comes here to our shop are already kids that fly fish pretty good, most of them, because they're, they're mountain kids from here, and it's what they've done with their dads and their grandpas, and it's just kind of fitting the puzzles together. Um, one of the things that, that we're working on now, and it's a kind of a it's kind of a new thing with high schools everywhere, is uh, we're doing a, a guide program with these kids. We're starting it up. We're just in the infancy of it. Um, but for for kids in a, a community like this, they're losing out for some. We're in a, a heavily tourist industry we don't have industry here in our town so much anymore it all went away um years ago with factories going to mexico and wherever our stuff did too it's textiles and lumber and things of that nature so of course it went away um and they're not coming back so uh, the, the only thing we have here is tourism and a lot of our kids are getting beat out of these jobs for kids other places or people from other places because they found out about outdoor leadership degrees or they found out about guide schools and things and so uh, one of the things we want to do is try to help our kids stay here instead of have to go somewhere else to find work. And it's like, okay, let's teach them how to work in these tourism industries. So one of the things we're working on is instead of them having to go and and uh, fork out the money, because that's expensive to go to a guy's school. you got a poor kid from the mountains here. He can't afford that. He's lucky to, you know, afford a good pair of shoes sometimes. Not everybody's poor here, but, I mean, it's, you know, we don't have as much as other places would. But you want those kids to be able to stay here and have those jobs that are, sustainable here in their home so help them help point them in that right direction so one of the things we're doing is is to start doing a guide school with the high schoolers so they're going to take several of those kids that are interested in doing this and are serious at it and it's going to be a, a program that goes and lasts for a few years i start it in their 10th grade year and go through their senior year and then you know the the kids at the end of that school or end up you know when they graduate high school if this is what they're wanting to do you know they've been through this program we know what kind of you know we know what qualities they've got work ethic they've got and the desire they've got and we're gonna put those kids to work and uh, and hire them on in the end of the industry so they'll come on work and be guides for us or if they want to go and be guides for somebody else hey right there's you a, a good stepping stone a good platform to help you do that and we kind of helping and showing them the way hey these are the possibilities these are things that's out there for you that you can do and it, it's amazing for them because a lot of them just have no idea that that these really cool jobs exist and heck they exist at home and uh i mean you see that in the whitewater industry here whitewater's huge here and uh there's all the time stuff the jobs in that industry it's huge and you just see them lose out to things like that and it's kind of sad it's like man we're not helping our own here to achieve some dreams and some things that they could do here that's sustainable so they they don't have to move off somewhere else and uh so it's been a really fun thing this year it's been one of those things that i'm really really excited about proud of probably more proud about that than about anything i've ever done honestly because i want to you know, my kids, in, I've got my sons interested in it. And I'm like, no, nah, you're not going to be a guide, man. You get, you're going to college, you get a degree, and, you know, do something, do something big, buddy. You ain't, you ain't doing this. But he's like, Dad, I want to be a guide. And, uh, you know, God, I hope not. But maybe if he does, I'm going to definitely give him every, every opportunity he can have. Um, but the uh, it's, it's just kind of neat to see it all play out with those kids like that. It gives them somewhere to come that's uh, it's a good, clean environment, something fun to do, something outdoors. I've always been a firm believer if you give kids something to do, and especially if you get them involved in the outdoors, they're going to get involved way less than like being apt to be mixed up in drugs or alcohol or mischief or just doing stupid stuff they shouldn't be doing. And I think a lot of that happens out of boredom. And if they had something to do that was uh, fun and was outside, a lot of that probably wouldn't happen. And, uh, you know, some of that stuff comes from, you know, having parents that are, you know, today it takes, you know, two people working in a household to, to make everything float. So, you know, a lot of times you look back and you don't have everybody, everybody's that way. I mean, you're like, wow, I worked and so much and I missed out on spending time with my kids and things. And sometimes you just don't realize it's happening. Kind of the thing in this industry or with being a guy in general is you, you work a lot and don't see, or just being a parent in general anyway, you, you just don't see that uh, you're working so much trying to provide and put things out there and want them to have the best thing possible or best life possible that you can put for them you you miss out on the biggest thing that's just spending time and going playing mm-hmm. with them and doing things with them and uh some you know things like that they could fall to the wayside or get into mischief or something otherwise so i think if you get them involved in the outdoors that probably was, that's going to help a lot keep mm-hmm. them keeping them kind of grounded and focused into something better well, that flows well into our last question but we like to ask this to different guests but to you what does success look like 
Wow. Um, man, that's kind of a tough one. I mean, I have a, a vision of where I want to be with, with our company and, you know, X each year, you know, two years, five years, 10 years, 15. Um, success for me looks like kind of what I'm doing now. I mean, it's, uh, I look back and I'm like, man, I've got, you know, a big guide staff that's successful. People like us. Um, you know, we're doing well. We're trucking right along in a business here and, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, we're giving back to the community and doing things for the community now, and they're able to do that and, uh, you know, mentor for kids and things in the community. And uh, I got involved with uh, our some of our local politics things. I'm on the Tourism Development Authority here. Um, the uh, – I was – it was my project to get the delayed harvest here on the Tuckasegee and Bryson City. That was my project solely on my shoulders, and uh, it was a lot of fun. I went to them with the idea and saw it all the fruition. Um I'm on the board with the uh, the museum for Southern Appalachian Fly Fishing Museum. We also just opened an aquarium last week that's 6,200 uh, gallon aquariums. It has uh, lots of fish and displays there from uh, the, all the fish around the Southern Appalachian Mountains. So it's a, it's a really epic in there. It's got some endangered species and things like that inside there. It's a really cool place, and it's, it's neat to be able to look and go, man, I'm helping make a difference and do something there. We're recognized now as the uh, the hub for fly fishing for the whole entire southeast for you know for for trout. And um, this is Bryson sees like the mecca for it, and you know it's been it's been fun. I've got to help do that stuff. So for me, success is setting back from when I was a kid. Um, I remember looking at we, you know, would see the the big river out here, and I'd see you know magazines and things with uh, drift boats running down rivers out west. And I was like, man, I wish we had that at home. I wish this my river because my river looks like this in a way. Why it'd be great to see this stuff out there and see this kind of culture happening here. And now it is, and it's. Uh, so for to me, a lot of the things that uh, that I wanted to accomplish, you know, has happened for me now at this point, and it's a uh, it's really neat feeling. I mean, it's almost surreal that you get to look back and say, like, "Man, this was all a dream," and then here it is. But it was uh, nobody gave it to me. I worked hard, and I mean, it was so you get knocked down more than you get to get up, and it's just just keep getting up, keep going, keep slugging along, and you know, make it happen. Just don't don't accept no and don't take any uh you know things to let you you know to kick you down or things like that if people say things or do things or whatever just use that as a fuel to throw in the fire and just make you work that much harder at it so that's kind of i always said and i tell my guides i work better when i'm mad <laughs> i'm more motivated um i'm usually a really laid-back guy so it's just everything just flows so i think i get more accomplished sometimes if if somebody does do something that kind of tilts me a little bit i'm like all right i'm more focused now this is gonna i'm gonna make this happen um but it, it's kind of i don't know it's neat to see see all this stuff go on it's uh it's cool it's uh i'm happy with where everything's at of course you never if you ever settled or satisfied or things like that, there's always things that you look at and say, okay, we can do this better, sharper, cleaner, and more professional. And I think this will make a greater trip for somebody or different things like that. And I always use um, our, uh, you know, we've got 16 guides and that's uh, 16 minds, that's 16 sets of eyes mm -hmm. and ears and thoughts and use that, mm -hmm. you know, get input and ideas from them guys too. So it's, uh, you know, you, even though I'm helming this thing or at the helm of this thing, it's, it, it doesn't mean I know well answers for everything. Mm -hmm. It's uh, guys have good opinions and good thoughts on it too. I'm like, oh, dang, that's a much better idea than I've got. Let's go with that. That's awesome. And uh, so, I, and I'm, you know, always, always open to something like that. Hmm. And if people want to follow you or come over here and fish, where do they need to go? Oh, okay. Oh, cool. I'll get to plug myself. Um, it's <laughs> Fly Fishing the Smokies. Um, you can find us at flyfishingthesmokies.net. Um, we're also on Instagram and Facebook, just with our namesake, Fly Fishing the Smokies, on there. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for hanging out with us tonight and being on the show. Hey, you're welcome. Thank you. Appreciate you guys having me. All right. Have a good one. You too. Hey, guys. Thanks for listening to the Captain's Collective. If you have any suggestions or people that you think we should interview, feel free to shoot us an email at hunter at captainscollective.com. Also, this podcast is part of the Waypoint Collective. You can head to Waypoint and check out more great podcasts and TV shows as well. Hope you enjoy. This is the Captain's Collective.